Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise be to Jesus. Wow, great to be here again and to have you tuned in. Thank you so much for finding time. This is our usual show, The Marvelous Believers Show, and it is always a pleasure to have you. It is always a pleasure to fellowship with you and uh, to share the word of God together. And I believe God has been teaching us, encouraging us, speaking to us, and let's share this word with as many people and friends as we can. Share the link even as we start right now. Let uh, someone join us and let's be blessed together. So today we are going to continue sharing the word of God. Um, and today I want I titled my word, The Greater Law, because I'm talking about a scripture, or I want us to discuss a scripture that is talking about laws. I believe there is a word for us. I believe this will speak to us. So I titled the word, The Greater Law, because I want us to look at this uh, word, and see what is this greater law that I'm talking about. So if you have your Bible somewhere, you can turn with me or I can read for you our scripture for the day or the main scripture. I know we will read a few more, but we can start with um, Romans chapter 8 and verse 2. Romans 8 and verse 2. And the Bible records, um, for the law of the Spirit since it's starting with 4, like a continuation, let's start with verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And I believe Paul is now explaining why there is no condemnation for those who walk in the Spirit. So it's a continuation. So verse 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. Wow. Wow, that's powerful, by the way. That's what I want us to talk about today. The law of the spirit of life has made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law of the sin and death could not do, Christ has done, or God has done through Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So let's, let's begin uh, by talking about what, what is law anyway, or how does this law operate? What are we talking about? Where did it start? What is the law we are calling the law of sin and death? Where did it begin? The law of sin and death began at the fall of man. When man fell from the presence of God, when man fell back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam fell, when we talk about man, we are talking about Adam, who is now the beginning of humanity. So when man fell from the Garden of Eden, he left the presence of God. He fell from the presence of God. He entered into another nature. He left, he was removed from the nature of God, and he got into another nature. Actually, he was separated from God. And that's where the, the first word of spiritual death began. Because when, you are, when we talk about spiritual death, we are talking about being separated from God, being away from God. That's why Paul in Ephesians says we were once dead in our trespass. We were not dead physically. We were dead spiritually in our trespass. So when man fell from the presence of God, or when he was separated from the presence of God, he died spiritually. He acquired another nature, and that's the nature of sin. And that's where the law of sin and death began. And so man began now living, but he is under the influence of a certain law, which is being called the law of sin and death. Now he was living subject to that law. He was living under that influence. Sometimes we talk about, uh, for example, when a person maybe as, is uh, drunk with alcohol, the traffic police will will find him because he's driving he's dangerous on the road he's drive he's not sober maybe his concentration is um is compromised maybe his focus is compromised because uh the the the, the effect of the alcohol in him is disturbing his his focus so he's under the influence of alcohol. So when we talk about a person being under the influence of this law, we are talking about there is a law that was now that now was introduced to man when he fell from 
the presence of God. He entered in a world or in a realm where now he was under the influence or subject to a law that is being called the law of sin and death. So that whatever he does, and however much he tries, he is subject to this law. And how does that law work? It works like, for example, we have the law of gravity. The law of gravity demands that whatever goes up, however much high it goes, however long it stays, it will come down. Something may be even blown by a wind and it flies up so high, but when that wind subsides, it is sure to come down. That's a law. Whether we believe it, whether we know it, whether we understand it, that is a law and it works. If something goes up, it comes down. That's the law of gravity. So when we talk about a law, we are talking about something that works, whether you believe it or not, whether you understand why or how, it is a law. So when we talk about the law of sin and death, it is a law. And when someone has, is spiritually dead, unfortunately, is subjected to that law is subject, is influenced, his life is under that law. So that you may find even, I know we know very many people that maybe while very well in their careers, very educated, I mean everything looks put together, but you find those are sometimes such a person is contemplating suicide, is depressed, has got bitterness, has a lot of anger, has issues. Why and everything else looks okay? Because there is a law that is still are pulling this person down. There's a law that is still operating in this person. If he has not been delivered from that law, there's a law that is still making that person feel like there's a void in his life, like things are not okay. In our physical eyes, actually, the, the facts are these things are okay. Everything looks well uh, put. But that person is still under a terrible law, the law of sin and death. It, it sounds as negative as it is. It cannot produce anything positive. It can only bring you down. It can only bring things to the negative. So that is why we are talking about uh, we have been delivered from the law of sin and death. So Paul in Galatians, and I will read it, Galatians chapter 3, Paul says, and verse um, 13, uh, Paul says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. So Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Uh, that the blessing of Abraham, verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So Christ came and became a curse. So that now us, we are not under the curse of the law. So when we talk about the curse of the law or the law, some, some of us or sometimes we have thought we are talking maybe about the Ten Commandments. No, actually we are not talking about the Ten Commandments. We were never even, uh, so many times I know church, the churches we've tried, uh, we have very many Christians who know, who have tried they do not steal, you know the Ten Commandments, they do not steal, they do not blaspheme, they do not commit adultery, they are not envious, they are, you know, all the Ten Commandments. And still, you have, they have not been able to achieve uh, a feeling of uh, lack of guilt. Paul, begin, remember when we started with Romans chapter 8, Paul, before he talked about we have been delivered from the curse of the law, he started by there is therefore now no condemnation. How many times have we seen... Uh, people in churches, uh, and they have tried to keep all the commandments, every one of them. But the truth is, it is not even possible. Remember the commandments, let me just put a disclaimer here. The commandments actually were not for the Gentiles. They were never for us. They were never meant for us. So we are not even being delivered from the, the law or the laws of Moses. And even if they were, they were meant, they were actually the commandments were given to the children of Israel, but God was touching grace. He was, he was making a way for mankind to be able to understand grace. He had chosen the house of Israel to, for the story of redemption, but he was trying to bring them closer to understanding the futility of trying on their own. So that he gave them the Ten Commandments, and after that, if you read uh, most of the Deuteronomy and Leviticus, the same commandments are being broken down into details, like do not steal, and then there is another two or three chapters explaining what this stealing is. 
And so they broke down from 10 to 600 and something, and it was not possible for anyone to be able to keep the law. That was just a way of God helping the people to understand grace, that you, you only can get born again by grace, that it cannot be because you have managed to keep the law. That is why uh, down there the Bible is talking about that even the Gentiles may be able to receive the promise of Abraham of faith because Abraham was, it was Abraham believed. The Bible says Abraham believed and it was accounted to him as righteous. It is only by believing. It is only by grace. It is because he believed, not because he behaved very well. Abraham actually was a an idol worshiper, but because he believed, it was accounted to him by faith. So when we talk about we have been delivered from the curse of the law, we are not talking about the Ten Commandments, which we know people have tried. It is only by understanding the grace of God and accepting the free gift of righteousness that we get delivered from the curse. And the curse we are talking about is the curse of the fall of man. The, the law of sin and death is the law that came from the fall of man, not from the Ten Commandments, not the laws of Moses, but the law that caught up with every humanity, everyone born on earth, finds themselves caught up under this law, find themselves subjected to this law, find themselves, because the Bible says, Abraham begot sons after him, who were like him, after he fell, Every other child that was born was in the nature of the fallen man. We, we covered that uh, about two weeks ago. So we are talking about men that have found themselves under, the, under a certain law that just operates. The way a child is born and by nature the child will grow, that is almost another law because a child just grows. That is how you find yourself. You are already under the law of sin and death and it begins to manifest. But let's look at what Christ did. Christ came. The only way to overcome such a law is to introduce a greater law. The only way to be able to undo such a law, it is only by introducing a greater law that can suppress that one. And Christ came, praise be to Jesus. He came, he says, I have come to fulfill the law. I have come and done away with the law of sin and death. And the minute you allow Jesus in your life, you receive now a new law, a greater law. That is what I'm talking about, a greater law that is able to undo the, the law that has been working in your life all the time. And here it is called the law of the spirit and of life. Hallelujah. That's another law. The law of spirit of life is another law. No wonder the psalmist in Psalms chapter 1, we were talking about it last week, says, whatever he does, this blessed man, whatever he does prospers. What magic is there? What criteria is there? What strategy is that? That whatever he does prospers. He bears fruit in his season. Nothing goes wrong. Why? Because there is a law that is working in that man. Hallelujah. That's why we call ourselves the marvelous believers. Because what works in us is a law of the spirit of life. It's a law that just produces positive vibes. It's a law that works positives. It's a law that does not allow sickness. Whatever you do prospers. It's a law that is contrary to the law of sin and death. While the law of sin and death would produce sickness, would produce poverty, would produce depression, would produce hatred and anger, the law of spirit and life just brings life. Hallelujah. Jesus, that's why Jesus was saying, I have come that you may have life and have life in abundance, that you may have life and have life in its fullness, because it's a law. It's not you giving yourself life. It's not you working about it. It is the law that is, you are under that law. Your life is influenced by that law. It just works. The minute you allow Jesus in your life, that law begins to work in your life. That law begins to take charge. That law now influences whatever you do. That's why we are able to say whatever you do prospers. Because Christ became the curse that he can deliver us from the curse of the law of sin and death. What the law of sin and death had, had subjected us to, 
so that you find people, everything else is there. Some of them have been born in very good families. Some of them found everything around them and they didn't have to struggle completely physically in this world. But there is something that is still making them feel like I am lonely, making them feel like uh, this life doesn't make sense again. There is still a law of death that is working in them. But when you have the law of life, the spirit of life, then life begins to ooze from you. Jesus was telling the disciples, from your belly will flow rivers of living water. Life begins to flow in you. You are a witness. You have seen people that are born again. A new creation believers that sometimes things have gone wrong. They've gone down, but from nowhere they rise. And they are back on their feet. And they are strong again. And they are smiling again. Because what is working in their life is a law. It is a law. It cannot change. It is a law. It cannot be undone. Praise be to Jesus. And I want to finish by reading uh, some, some three verses that uh, I, 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 I really love them. They will make sense to us just now as we finish in Hebrews. Actually, if you read uh, Hebrews from chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, it's talking about the complete sacrifice that Jesus became. The way he came and, co and became a sacrifice once and for all. The way he came and did one ultimate sacrifice that you will never have to repeat again. So I'm reading these three verses as we finish so that we, we can just see how this greater law is. I'll start with, um, that is Hebrews chapter, I'll start with verse, chapter 7, verse 27. Verse 27 says, mm, we are, f for, okay, let me read from verse 26. For such a high priest was fitting for us, that is Jesus, who is holy, harmless, and defiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. So the writer of Hebrews is saying Jesus became such a sacrifice. He did not need to, to be offering every day. Now today we have their sacrifice to atone for the sins. Uh, every year we have a sacrifice to cleanse what every year. The high priest used to do this so often. But now Jesus came and became a sacrifice. The Bible says he did once for all when he offered up himself. So again, verse uh, chapter 9. Chapter 9 and verse uh, 12, the writer writes, mm, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. He entered once and for all. He obtained eternal redemption. And uh, chapter 10 Chapter 10 and verse 14, um, he says, um, For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So the Bible, the Hebrews is talking about having become an eternal redemption, having obtained an eternal redemption. He entered, he became a sacrifice once and for all. And now he says, he has even perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So we are talking about a law that came as a greater law. And the concept I wanted to introduce with the Hebrews is that it cannot, there is none that will ever come that can be greater than this one. This became the ultimate law. This became the final. Jesus in John chapter 10 was saying, the sheep, uh, my sheep know my voice. And he was talking about the sheep that the father has given me. No one can snatch them from me. I have given them eternal life and no one can snatch them from me. Why would Jesus say that with such confidence? He knew this was the ultimate sacrifice. He knew there is no other law that can come to supersede the law that he has subjected us to. The law of spirit and life. He knew that he has given us a life that cannot be taken away. He knew it was the ultimate sacrifice. It was the highest, maybe I could call it the highest bidder, the highest... Uh, Payment, the highest price that could ever be paid. So when Jesus is talking about no one can snatch them from me, he knows there will never be another law that will be above the law that he has given us, the law of spirit of life. So we can celebrate because we have been delivered from the law of sin and death, from the law that subjected us to failure, 
from the law that subjected us to spiritual death, from the law that subjected us to poverty and lack, from the law that subjected us to sickness and disease, from the law that subjected us to bitterness and anger. And we have been brought into the another law. We have been subjected. We have been put under the influence of a new law. And this is the greatest law. There will never be another. And that is the law of spirit of life. That is the law that cannot allow you to go down. That is the law that will not allow sickness in your body. You just need to know it. You just need to be aware. By the way, when sickness tries to come to your body, you remember that I don't operate under this realm. There was a realm where sickness, I was subjected to sickness, but not anymore. Now I operate in a realm that is under the influence of a spirit of life. Spirit of life cannot condone sickness. Spirit of life cannot allow bitterness. Where would anger come from? Where would suicidal thoughts come from? When I know I am subjected under another law, and that is the law of the spirit of life. That is the law under which we operate. And Jesus says, nobody will ever get you from there. There will never be another law. Let nothing ever make you think, oh, is there another one operating? It cannot. It is not possible. That is how final it is. He became the ultimate sacrifice. He, be he paid the highest price that could ever be paid. No one else will ever pay anything. What we have received is eternal life. What we have received is the best that can ever be received now and even the life to come. So we continue to celebrate that we are now living under the law of the spirit of life, under the law that gives us an advantage, a law of favor, a law of grace, a law of advantage. And that's where we are, the marvelous believers. Hallelujah. I wish to stop here for, to, for today. Uh, let's just walk away and rejoice that we live under this law. Just like there is a law of gravity that works whether we understand or not. There is a law of spirit of life that works in us. That just makes things work. That just makes things positive. That makes your life possible. That makes sense in your life. That's where we have been brought by the grace of God. May the Lord continue uh, to help you to understand. Even as we continue teaching and learning more about this, let's, let's be sensitive that this is where we are. This is the law under which we operate. This is the Marvelous Believer Show on Wema TV. Thank you for always tuning in, supporting us, uh, praying with us, and uh, fellowshipping with us. Remember to share this link with someone and keep blessed.